Welcome to Study on Revelation. Let me do a little couple of introduction. We'll get started. Uh, a few things to give you, hopefully, some accurate expectations of the class. Okay? Y'all okay? Uh, one is, this is not an expositional study of the entire book. Expositional means verse by verse by verse. We will cover a lot of verses. We will cover some of that, but to do so would take probably a year to go over the whole verse, but we're not doing that. This should be like a six to eight week, maybe eight week class. That's the goal. So I will go pretty slowly over the first few chapters, and then I'm going to skip ahead. The second reason, you'll trust me, when we get to that point, you're going to be such experts on Revelation. You'll say, oh, now I see the pattern, because there is a pattern. And so I won't go verse by verse, but it'll take, I'm not doing that. I'm just, I'm just giving you a heads up. So if you're thinking David's going to spend two years, I'm not going to spend two years, maybe about eight weeks roughly on it. Besides my time, I'll be on vacation, which is uh, the months of August through December. So I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing, I haven't told the elders yet, don't tell them. Uh, this, oh, wait, John's here. The second thing is, um, this is the commentary that I recommend the most for the book of Revelation. A commentary is a book by, a good commentary is by a biblical scholar who specializes in that and it writes books about the biblical books. And they write commentaries. So comment here's a open here, everybody, if you want, here's an open seat for you. Uh, so this is the one I recommend the most is actually is the, the 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 gentleman who wrote this actually happens to be also the professor I had in my PhD who taught me apocalyptic literature. His name is Charles Talbert. So I ordered two or three copies I thought and one has come in for our Hill Church bookstore. As far as I can tell is the only one that made it. So outside of Greta's oatmeal cream pies, there's going to be a mad rush, rush on. If you want this, there's one so far. It's $15. Now, here's the deal. It's a little more hard. To, Amazon sells them, I think, and Christian Book sells them. They're about $20, $25 a piece. If you want it and you cannot afford it, I'll buy it for you. Just come tell me privately. I have no problem with that at all. The church will take care of it, okay? Uh, if you can't afford it, you want to buy it and you want to order I'd say go ahead and order it now so that gives you... Because tonight's more introduction, and we won't really get to Revelation really next week. So this is it right here. It's called The Apocalypse. The Apocalypse by Charles Talbert. Charles Talbert. T-A-L-B-E-R-T. Charles Talbert. And I can pass this around if you want. Uh, the Apocalypse. It's a thin book. It's concise. I think it's easy to read. Okay. So. Apparently we have no wi fi here. Oh no. Are you a Christian? Christians work. You don't know I'm kidding yet. There's Wi Fi. There's Wi yeah. Try. Um, but anyway, if you want to help afterwards, I'd be happy. Again, there's one book for sale tonight, but I'd recommend it. And I will use that myself. I don't have all the revelation. The symbols are, there's a plethora. There's so many of them. I don't have them all memorized of what that meant here back then. So I talk about commentaries all the time. Called The Apocalypse. Yep. Um, there we go. Anything for me? Any questions, comments? Here comes two more. All right, does so everyone have a handout? Thank you, man. Here. We ran out. Can we start sharing for a couple? Another here's about four, five, six right here. Come on in. We have seats here. Seats there. We got some open spots right here if you want, and right over there. It's good to see y'all. Now, don't put, the, don't put him near the oatmeal cream pie. I don't want to be tempting. <laughs> now, go for it. You move this stuff over. All right, so I just explained the commentary that I prefer. It's right here. This is the one I prefer the most. Okay, you should have a handout. What I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to do some introductory stuff. And I want to start out with explaining a way of reading the Bible that you may never have heard of, but you have been influenced by it if you have ever been in the church for a long period of time. So some of you are new Christians, you're new to church, this will sound brand new to you, that's fine. For other people, it's not brand new, you have heard this kind of stuff before. And there's a system of interpretation called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism. Anybody have heard that term before? Dispensationalism? We got two or three, good. It is a whole system of how to interpret the Bible that tries to take almost everything literally, literally, especially regarding Old Testament prophetic materials. Now, I'm reading my hand. I'm looking right here at the first paragraph. I'm looking right there, okay? I'm right at the top. You know what I'm talking about? You with me? Some of y'all look around. I'll make sure you're on the same spot. 
But the guy's name that was the most important is John Nelson Darby. John Nelson Darby, he lived in the early 1800s, early up to the 19th century, and he started Plymouth Brethren. Uh, a little quick overview, Darby was a lawyer, very smart, got two degrees, got good grades, um, eventually retired from law, lawyering because he thought it went at odds with the Christian view, Christian views, and so he quit. He became a pastor instead, uh, which is interesting because John Calvin, Jean Calvin was also a lawyer in Geneva, if you know that guy. Anyway, so he left and became a Christian, but um, Darby and many people in, the, in Ireland where they were were really unimpressed with the role of the church at the time. And so they formed the Plymouth Brethren because they chose not to call other people different titles. They didn't want to call someone pastor this or discipleship leader or whatever. Everyone's his brethren or sister. So there, he liked a clean split between uh, the church and how they're supposed to relate versus what the world does. Uh, and he, amongst a few other people, interpreted the Bible in a particular way. One day, uh, the, the guy comes along in town and says, the people in your church who got baptized, their baptisms don't count if they don't swear allegiance to the new king. And people in that town, that church, did swear allegiance to that new king, so none of his baptisms count. He was very upset about that. Not long after, he fell off the source, he broke his leg, he was healing. And while he's there, he's reading back his Old Testament, his Bible, and says, you know what, Come to, I'm paraphrasing, this is pretty close though. The church should never really have happened. The church shouldn't be here. What God really wanted to do was do certain things to the Jews on earth. That's what he really wanted. But since they were obtuse, obstinate, he had to bring in the church. And he called the church an apostrophe. Uh, they're like, well, okay, okay, the church. But then, so now what happens is God has this church here, but that's he has two different peoples of God. And he, the, the church can have their own destiny, but the the original plan of the Jews, they've got to have their own destiny. Well, at the time period, or in the early 19th century, there were big Bible conferences. If you imagine in America, it was the thing to go to, particularly in New York and New England. They would have big prophecy conferences and Bible conferences, and the big names of the time would come into town and preach and teach these biblical methods and on and on. They were wildly popular. When he spoke of that, most people disregarded it his system of thought. But some people did not disregard it. And that's what I have right here. A few people said this is the way to think about the Bible. People like James Brooks, Dwight L. Moody. If you know Dwight Moody, he's a big name in Christian history. Uh, he didn't agree with everything, but he was a dispensationalist. And all of his lieutenants and these revivals. And then a guy named Cyrus Schofield was also a lawyer, very rich. He came up to Darby and said, I tell you what, I like the way you read the Bible. I'll take all your notes if you'll let me, and I'll turn it to a study Bible, the first study Bible in the history of the world. He took Darby's notes and put them on the biblical text. And so then what happened was, so in Matthew 24 or so, instead of saying, um, instead of saying just the chapter divisions, it would say something like, uh, Jesus speaks of the rapture. And then it would have the Bible text. So these, these subheadings were... Darby's interpretation, and then beneath the text, there were a bunch of uh, notes, all from Darby. Well, that was called the Schofield Chain Reference Bible, and at the time, for a long time, it was a top-selling Bible in history. Thank you. One more. Look at there, just in time. One more. Um, one more commentary that we got is, now we have two. You can fight over that to the death, and, uh, if you want. So the, the Schofield Study Bible went rapid, I mean, crazy in America, uh, and because of, because of that study Bible. And then a few schools were started specifically to propagate his view of how to interpret the Bible called dispensations. The Moody Bible Institute, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, which is now called Biola University, it was started to form to propagate dispensationalism. Dallas Theological Seminary was started to propagate dispensationalism. Uh, and to this day, DTS, Dallas Theological Seminary, is still a, a big beacon Almost everybody, not all, but almost every professor there is a hardcore dispensationalist. Um, and then, of course, that's what happened. So it became very popular in America amongst certain laity, particularly the Protestant version. Eventually it happened in England. There was a movement there. It died off. And all around the world, everybody else was unconvinced. This is not in Catholicism. It's not in the Orthodox tradition. 
It's not in any other part of the world. To this day, it won out in America and only in certain Protestant churches. And it wasn't really a household name until some popular level novels got out. Things called Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth that came out about 1967, 68. Is that right? Carl was about 40 back then. And uh, Jerry Dickens' Left Behind series, about 400 models. Remember the Left Behind series? Have you read the Left Behind series? Yeah. My, my father-in-law has read those like eight times. He's got all three of them or whatever, how many. Uh, when those became, you know, multi, multi, multi-million dollar seller books, that's when the public really got a hold of a popular level of what's called dispensationalism. So in reality, a small segment of the church that has over 2 billion people on the planet follow it. But because we live in America and we're Protestant and now we're at, is this Midwest and whatever, correct me the South and Midwest, it is a, a dominant way. So now almost everybody who ever talks about the end times immediately assumes dispensationalist theology. Just to say the word rapture, pre-trib, post-trib, whatever trib, you have immediately adopted one very particular way of reading the Bible that was really made almost completely invented, almost invented, but made popular by John Nelson Darby. There are some main tenets of it, and I'll put that in your handout, some main uh, tenets or points um, of it. And the first one is this, that, that God tested and judged humans in seven different eras or epics or dispensations. So seven. Now, today, dispensationalists disagree. Some say, some say there's three dispensations. Some say there's five. Some say there's ten. They disagree. But Darby seems to have held there were seven. Uh, and there's seven are the age of innocence, the age of conscience, the dispensation of human government, a promise law, and so forth. Um, and that's what, is, so a dispensation just means a period of time, a period of time. And each time there's something very different, like uh, the innocence of Adam and Eve is stage one, then he tests them with the fruit, and they fail, so then he starts one of the age of conscience, and on and on it goes. And those are distinct eras, distinct dispensations. A second major tenet of John Nelson Darby's theology is that there is a radical distinction between Israel and the church, two different people of God and two different destinies. Israel's supposed to be on earth based on his interpretation of Isaiah 32, which I'll just tell you right now, has nothing to do with that. Isaiah 32 is about Israel coming back from Babylon in exile to come back to Israel, and that is what happened. Darby thought that had wasn't been finalized. It wasn't fulfilled. Everyone else in the world disagrees with him, but that's what he thought. Then he thinks the church is meant to live in a spiritual state in heaven, which has nothing to do with physical stuff. It's a spiritual state. That's also not biblical. That's Platonic. That's from Plato. But I'm telling you, I've never walked in a church in my life, and I've been in a lot of them, that does not assume what I just said here. There's two different peoples of God, two different destinies, two whatever. If you've ever watched people on TV, like a John Hagee, you know, old John Hagee and Blood Moon, I mean, on and on and on it goes. Uh, there's a radical distinction between law and grace. Very different concepts to Darby. Uh, he called the church a parenthesis. It was never intended. Therefore, the church has to get out of the way for what God really wanted to do. And so he made up this concept called rapture. Uh, I'll say something real quickly about rapture, if I, if I might. Um, have you ever heard the term rapture, right? Some of you have. If you're a new Christian and you haven't heard that, it's okay with me. Um, I mean, no matter what you heard, I'm just saying it. You don't, don't feel like you're behind. But anyway, even in popular literature in English, like on the news, sometimes you'll hear that. Or now it's a metaphor to be you know, caught up in rapture, like a love interest. But rapture comes from rapturas, uh, in, which is Latin, right? Rapturas. And the, 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 what's the very first problem with calling any kind of biblical theological concept in Latin? It's not in Scripture. It's not in scripture. Why is that, John? It's the New Testament. New Testament was written in Greek, brother. That's right. So this is Latin, which means it's nowhere in the Bible. There are some Latin loan words, but that's the first problem. And what he it comes from two places in the entire New Testament, which we'll talk about tonight or maybe tomorrow, or I mean next time a little bit, which is first Thessalonians 4 and a text in Revelation 3. And most people, most every scholar in the world thinks he's misunderstood it. But nevertheless, that's where it comes from. It comes from his interpretation of two biblical texts. 
So the church has to get out of the way so that God can do what he really wanted to do through Israel. And then, of course, two different moments. The rapture, so that that church has got to go away before tribulation. And then the second coming of Christ, seven years of tribulation, leading up to a big battle called Armageddon, where Jesus will intervene, he allows Jews to stay on earth, and the kingdom is centered in Jerusalem. And there's a lot of features to that, a lot of uh, nuance, and dispensationalists disagree amongst themselves, as all humans do, that's, that's fine. Um, but there are a lot of, one thing also very common in dispensationalism is the belief that when Israel gets reestablished and there's a kingdom of Israel in Jerusalem today, like literally you fly there, then that will mark the end of the Jesus, the end of our time, and Jesus will return. And that's one of the main reasons why there are certain churches, like a John Hay is leader, who pray incessantly for Israel to be restored, Israel to be restored, temple to be rebuilt, temple to be rebuilt, temple, because if they're convinced, once that happens, then the Antichrist will come, and then we get raptured. So they're using that for another end, which is we want to go to heaven, and we want to get out of the way, and so we want Israel to be restored. Uh, that's part of the motivation. So I say this to say in a quick overview, you can read books on this topic. There are intelligent dispensationalists. There are Christian dispensationalists, my goodness. Uh, but when I, I'm saying this the first thing because, as I always do when I teach this course, because let me say a few things about why I did it. Number one is I am not a dispensationalist. I find it overall to be overwhelmingly unpersuasive. I've looked up all the arguments I could find, all the interpretations. I think they're very unconvincing. You might find them convincing. That's fine. You, I, I can recommend some. Uh, some I don't. I have to look more who they were. I used to know more off the top of my head some dispensationalist scholars. I just don't find them persuasive. And so, so that's why I bring it up is to say, the course I'm about to teach is not an anti-dispensationalist class. I don't have time for that or even desire to do that. Every once in a while, I'll say, you'll read this in dispensationalist. Every once in a while, in general, I'm not doing that. I, I said this introduction is give you good expectations. One is, we're not going to go verse by verse. My second is, this is not a dispensationalist class. So if you come here to the study expecting me to go, okay, I got 14 charts on when he can come back. Pre-trip, post-trip, you get to pick, and we're going to have a big battle at the end. Man, you're going to be very disappointed. I won't talk about it at all. I don't find it persuasive. And also, I'm not mean, so I don't say, that's so dumb. I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm not... Um, I don't waste my time on that. So what will I do? If I'm not going to spend my time fo focusing on what I think is not persuasive, what I want to do instead, and this is what you get to decide. You always do, right? You're the judge and jury. I will instead present to you standard New Testament scholarship on the book of Revelation. And what standard scholarship is, we read things in their context, as I'll talk about in a second, in its historical literary context, and then we try to make conclusions based on that. We don't come to the text with huge theological systems in place and then see how it fits a schema. We don't. We just don't read it that way. And scholars don't, and I was trained by scholars, and I find that persuasive. So, so, so what I've told people through the years, I have taught this class, and I've had dispensationalists come and stay, and still may not be as persuasive. Praise God. Okay, great. But I just encourage them. I'm not here to persuade you. I'm not here to convince you. But I would encourage people, hey, maybe this is an alternative way to read it you never thought about. And maybe at least leave here and go, now I've got two ways to read it. Maybe you think David's crazy. That's fine. But maybe not. Maybe it's possible there's some insight to be had. That's all. Does that make sense? Let me say this real quickly. I'm going to pause for any questions you have about this. And I'm going to move on. Any questions or comments? I This through the years. I've learned this in 20, 20 years. David, do you want Jesus coming back? Yes, I do. Uh, so you don't think it's true? Yes, I think it's true. I don't think the way Darby interpreted it is true. You don't believe in the Bible? Of course I do. Um, do you love Jesus? Yes. Am I married? Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm, so I mean, having said that, what questions do you have for me? What questions? Any questions? Any questions at all? Did you try the book of Revelation? Very good. I have one. I haven't tried them with crowd. I want to badly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You thought Christ was returning for his bride. You thought Christ was returning for his bride. Yeah, it says the church, God's plan not intended to, must be removed into the rapture. You thought that Christ was going to return for his bride. Right. Uh, good. And the bride 
guy was still here on earth when he comes out. Correct. <laughs> yes? Can you say more? No, I just, I just want to add that. It says, the church is a parenthesis in God's plan, not intended and must be removed. That is the rapture. Correct. So the rapture, again, is the concept that God must come down and remove the church to accomplish what he really wanted to accomplish originally. I'm persuaded that's absolutely incorrect, that God does not want to remove the church to do what he really wanted to do originally. I'm convinced that all the New Testament authors agree that Jesus is what God wanted to do originally. He is the point, and he is the consummation. And so he does not want to remove the church to do something else and we don't have two different peoples of God. The church is the people of God. Anybody who follows Jesus is. That's my interpretation of the New Testament documents. And so God does not want us to get out of the way. That's my view. And so to be the body of Christ means we are the body of Christ. We're not an inconvenience to him. That, that's my view. But yeah, that, and again, over time, we'll talk some about that. Uh, fr frankly, Revelation talks very little about that. Very little, very little. Uh, tonight we can talk some more about that. If we get to 1 Thessalonians 4, we can. Um, so, it's that, for, again, what's hard sometimes for anybody to grasp, maybe no one else is hard, maybe online, maybe you're not having a difficult time, but just in case. The, again, concept of rapture is a particular theological lens through which to view what will happen at the end of time. It is not to say the New Testament doesn't teach the church that Jesus will return. That's why I already answered that question. He will return. The New Testament teaches that many times. He does return. He will return. And then he will, that all the new creation, new heavens. That's Revelation 21. But what the New Testament does not teach, I'm persuaded, at all, is that it'll come to take us out of the way so that people can keep on going and doing what they're doing. That is not at all what happens. That is not, that's a bad interpretation of 1 Thessalonians 4, which we'll go there in a little bit. So he does come for us. At least that's what Paul believed. And all the revelation, I would argue. And Jesus believed that too. So he does come back. The exact. Well, if we get to it, I'll talk about it. Yeah. Good, good. Thank you for that. Anything else? Any questions or comments? Anything at all? You're safe to ask. And you can disagree. That's fine too. Anything at all? It's okay to leave now. This is so upsetting. You're just like, I'm, I came here for a chart. I'm out of here. I don't have a chart. I just don't have a chart. Now, now Pastor, you know I told you that I'm going to go over there to that point. That's right. Halfway through. In a so second. I'm, watch. I'm not, I'm not walking out on you. Tim's going to get real upset in a second and leave. Watch this. Watch this. Uh, 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 keep talking. Uh, <laughs> no. I'm going to turn that. I'm going to. Uh, he really is leaving in a second. I'm giving him a hard time. He's going to leave. But we'll see what triggers him. Okay. Let me see how... Okay, I'm move ahead. There's nothing else. Let's go. You ready? Okay, so let's talk for a second about genre. <coughs> genre just me. <laughs> Y'all pray for my puberty. I'm, I'm, I'm working hard. Okay. Genre means literary type. Okay? Now, if you've done the study how to read the Bible for all it's worth, this should not be any surprise. But uh, the way I argue and everybody in scholarship argues that whenever any human being ever reads a text ever, the first thing you do instantaneously is determine the genre. We all do it. Nobody in their right mind reads a newspaper like they do a cookbook. Nobody does that. No one reads a Stephen King novel like you just don't. Nobody does. The first thing you do is when you... Now, how do we know the difference? You might go to a, a library and it says fiction. That gives us telltale signs. Or we start learning that it looks like a novel with a... A dude with a six-pack and looks like John Swanson on the cover. It's a romance novel. <laughs> <laughs> But and, and, and clearly that's nonfiction. <laughs> so it's, I'm just jealous of him. Like, you know, <laughs> reading about all these years, I'm jealous. Uh, so all that to say, we know on the front side it's probably a romance novel. Uh, we just do it all the time. Pick the news editorial. It says editorial. Those words let us know. But let's assume for a second we didn't have words that said fiction or editorial or cookbook. But you just open and start reading something. If you've read, outside of being a five-year-old, right, but I mean, a normal functioning adult will read it pretty quickly and go, this looks like a cookbook, 350 degrees, six cups of sugar. I'm guessing it's oatmeal cream pie that I've been waiting on for all my life. It's a lot of sugar. A lot of sugar. Oh. So, well, we do that all the time. I'm saying this because 
Everybody does it. This isn't a fancy scholar trick. We all do it. There's one particular thing I want to talk about because this is so important about genre. When we go to the biblical text, scholars do the same thing, just like you do with cookbooks or whatever. You go to any kind of biblical text, and this is my Greek New Testament, so it's a collection of 27 books. And if I didn't know off the top, I'm just reading these books and go, what is this thing? How should I read it? Is it more like a cookbook or is it more like this or whatever? Let me give two quick analogies to help prove to make a point. One is, when I know for a fact I'm reading poetry, everybody who knows anything about poetry at all knows poetry loves metaphor, they love simile, where things represent something else. And so I use an analogy often, as I do, which it works, which is you read this, this narrative, you picked up the sand of Florida, <gasps> a parchment. He felt butterflies in his stomach. I wonder what kind of butterflies it was. <laughs> so if someone said that question, so he should laugh. So he goes, what kind of butterfly was it? I thought, hold on a second, but I think that's, I think that's, that's a, probably a poem. Go on, really, oh yeah, the sunset sets in your eyes. I feel like, yeah, man, that's a poem. No, it's not. Do you not believe in truth? Yeah, I believe in truth. It's just, that's not a, that's a poem, man. You shouldn't, it's not a, no, not a real butterfly. I can read. Do you not believe in words? I can read like you can read. I, it says, felt butterflies in your stomach. It is right, but it's not, it doesn't mean that. So you think it's not true? Yes. The question is, what kind of truth is it trying to convey? What type of truth is it trying to convey? That is a central question that all of us humans ask when we read a text. Is it true that 350 degrees equals what I want it to mean? No, it's a cookbook. What kind of truth is it trying to convey? That you should turn that knob or push the button at 350 degrees. It's not a metaphor. Poetry is different. Poetry tries to evoke what something feels like. You might say, well, a physiological response in my belly called adrenaline. Okay, but tell me what it feels like to be in love. How do I describe that? That's a very important point. Almost one, I'll say 99%, I think it's 100. 99% of prophecy in the Old Testament and the New Testament is poetry. You can tell that by the way the Hebrew is written in the Old Testament while the Greek is in the New Testament. It's poetry. And so you treat it like poetry. You mean it's not true? I didn't say it's not true. The question is what type of truth is it trying to convey? And almost the entire book of Revelation is written in the genre. It's poetic. I'll say I'll call it poetic. We can tell that by the way it's written. And so they love metaphor and simile. I'll get more of that in a second. But the question is, what type of truth is it? That's the question. It's not a fancy trick. It's everyone knows that. The same thing occurs when people read the book of Revelation. And yes, these do often go together. The book ends, Genesis 1 and 2. There are people who have told me adamantly to my face, very upset. If you do not read it their way, that's a literal 24-hour, 60 creation, da 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 you don't believe in truth. That's my, my analogy. You don't believe in truth? You don't believe in God's word? It, David, it just comes down to this. It comes down to God's word? Where is man's word? You've chosen man's word. That's your problem. My response is, no, I've not. That's a false, silly dichotomy. <clears throat> you are arguing how to read it is based on a certain genre. We disagree not on the concept of truth. We disagree on what kind of genre it is. Revelation fits that. So people who are dispensationalists tend not to read Revelation as a particular genre that I do. I'm not about to explain what it is. They tend to read it as something else. They read it much more like, here's my second major point, they read it like a weather report. <laughs> right? Every time I turn on the news, upcoming next, and they will predict the next seven days. How much sunshine, rain, temperature, they're never right. I get it, okay, but they're close. It's not like Wednesday is going to be hot. No, there's a hurricane. They're close. They're close. So it's been 90 degrees almost Wednesday. It's not going to snow. They're not going to be that wrong. They're close. When people look at a weather report on TV or news, they hear it. They don't take it metaphor. You don't, I'm assuming. You don't take it metaphorically. It's not a simile. It's not hyperbole. 88 degrees means it's going to be really hot. No, it doesn't. That means they think 88 degrees Fahrenheit is exactly the number will come out to be. A lot of people read Revelation like it's a weather report. It's predicting the future. And so when it says the moon will turn to blood, they go, yeah, by what time? 
7.30 Central? Or is that Eastern time? Or is that Israel time? When the sun will fall from the earth or the stars will fall, what time will that happen? Let's see, is that on Thursday or Friday? They think it's like a weather report. For the rest of us, people who study this for, basically for a living, we say you have completely misunderstood the genre. You've completely misunderstood it. Their response is, you don't believe in scripture, you don't love Jesus, you, it's all about you and God's work. And that becomes this name-calling junk that is very frustrating and sad in the church. And I'm sorry to say it to you, a new Christian, I'm telling you, I'm telling you it happens. Some Christians have been so mean, they're convinced their interpretation is the only one. If you don't have their view, you're just not a Christian. I don't share that view. You can have different views than me and still be a Christian. So what I am arguing is, and virtually every scholar, every scholar argues basically in the world, is that uh, that Revelation fits a particular genre called apocalyptic. Now, apocalyptic, that's what's on your handout. If you turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, I'll prove it to you. I've worried least where the word comes from. This might be one of the only times tonight going with Revelation, sorry. We will look at it closely, believe me, we're coming. But I found these introductions to be necessary. Revelation 1, 1. It's the last book. It won't take you that long to find it, I hope. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. And so the very first word, does yours say probably the, right, in translation? Oh, they lied to you. No. In Greek, it, there is no the. It's just, in Greek it says apocalypses. Apocalypses. So that's the word apocalypse. Literally in Greek it says apocalypse of Jesus Christ. So if Revelation is fine, because that's a good translation of it. So Revelation is a translation of the word apocalypsis, or the revealing, the revealing. Like someone who is hidden and they get revealed. I like the big makeover shows. Right, they, mean they come behind the curtains and boom, that's revelation. That's all that means, it's a revelation of something. So what happened is <laughs> scholars for a long time, we look up, and people much better than I am, for a living, read everything ever written ever. <laughs> Greek, Greek literature, Roman literature, that's in Latin. Uh, so Greek literature, Latin literature, Egyptian literature, Hebrew, everything. And they catalog all these things and say, these books and these letters and these documents share similar tone, vocabulary, style, length. That fits a genre, probably. Like gospel. Oh, that's like an ancient a biography or life. But this fits a letter. And then there's one thing called that they're going to call apocalyptic from this exact word. The problem is apocalyptic literature as a genre is dead. No one writes that way anymore. It won't make the New York Times bestseller list. No one writes that way anymore. Unless, I don't know, Jill might be out. Are you trying to? No, she's not. I tried, Jill. That scared face. No, I didn't mean to. Uh, no, they don't do it anymore. People don't do it anymore. Well, that's hard for me because I don't think that way. I think in, I mean, I get poetry. They still write in that genre. Right, I mean, we can long list of genres, newspaper articles, but people don't write this way anymore. But they used to. They did for centuries. Around 200 BC to about 300 AD, so about four or 500 years, it was popular. It was a popular genre. And we know that because we've uncovered many, you can read many, many of them. In my PhD class on apocalyptic literature, the first half of the semester, that's all we did. We read portions of, or, whole por or the, whole, the whole or portions of, all the Jewish and Christian apocalypse is written. And the last half of the semester, we did just the book of Revelation. And that was the great way to do it. He was right. I mean, by the time you get to Revelation, you go, this isn't that weird at all. Because by then you, you see, oh, there now I'm getting all the pattern, the pattern, the pattern. Now, I needed that because I never read Revelation that well. I never read other apocalypse literature, but I've read letters before. So when I read the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, I go, oh, I can spot a letter. I know that genre. I can't spot apocalypse literature until I went through that class. And you can buy English translations called Apocalyptic Reader, and it's segments or portions of tons of these things. So, scholars say, Revelation fits perfectly in that. Now, it's a little twist, but I'll go there in just a second. What is the apocalyptic genre? Uh, the genre is composed of a narrative form. It is narrative, but there's poetry, as you were, inside of it. And it either a human either receives a message from a heavenly figure, or is taken on a heavenly journey. And you'll see in Revelation which one this is, because they all fit one of these categories, all of them do. One of my papers on PhD was on the exact point, that there's one or the other, one or the other, all the time. It fits the genre. If today, if I told you, once upon a time, am I talking about a cookbook? Is an editorial? If I said once upon a time, you know right away what am I talking about, probably. I'm going to tell you what. 
a fairy tale. Immediately I do. And me and everybody, and you're right to think that. If I go, once upon a time, there's a president named Trump two years ago. You say, what? No, you shouldn't sound so realistic. Once upon a time means in a far, far country, far, far away, and so forth. That's what all people do with a genre. And Revelation fits a genre. So when a person shows up and says, I had a vision from an angel, and he and I saw this, or I went on a journey. We got Chuck saying once upon a time. Everybody, oh, it's a, it's a revelation. It's apocalyptic literature. Boom. It's that common. It's that common. It's one of the telltale signs. And I put this, think of walking in a dream. And you had the most, the technical word is phantasmagoria. It's this otherworldly, wild, you know, dream sometimes can be very vivid. Other times it's kind of blurry. And they have wild images of things like, man, what did I drink last night? What did I eat last night? What in the world? Why did it so crazy? Well, then you had to come back and then describe that dream. And that's what ancient people call visions. Visions function just like dreams. And that's what apocalyptic literature tried to do. It tried to communicate a vision like a dream. There's heavy imagery and symbolism to express how heavily events serve as comfort and catalyst for change now. What I mean by that is, if you saw what's going on in the heavenly realm, you go, whoa, that's what's going on? Boy, that's encouraging. For example, in Revelation 4, we have a classic throne room scene. It fits similar to Ezekiel 1 and Isaiah 6, because that's where he got it from, almost all of it. And before the throne room, we'll talk about this, there is this, uh, right after the throne room, there's a sea of glass. We go, wow, God likes glass. Barb's not going to clean that. She doesn't like clean glass, she told me. So, good for you, angels. I'm not doing it. She's up there just squeaking away, whatever. Well, we all know, of course, the image, and he, he's sitting on a throne. It's a rainbow. He's surrounded by a rainbow. Well, virtually all scholars agree. Of course, it's all symbolism. The sea is glass because the sea in Judaism and the ancient world represented chaos and disorder. But not anymore because now it's glass. There's no more disorder in front of God's throne. The rainbow represents, of course, God's mercy. Because the last time a rainbow was mentioned in Genesis, it was one, I'm not going to kill everybody. I'm not going to judge everybody. So that's encouraging for people who are going through a lot of hell on earth to go, okay, all the world looks like it's gone crazy, but before God Almighty, it's not. And his world, everything's fine. Not, it, the universe, the cosmos really isn't out of control. And that's encouraging. Sometimes it's very challenging. Sometimes we'll see in Revelation uh, 1, we see this image of Jesus, this fantastic symbolic image of Jesus. It's it's not, oh, he's, a, he's my buddy. Let's sing songs about my buddy Jesus. He's my co-pilot. The image of Jesus here is terrifying. And that's biblical. Every time, I, every once I'm going to preach, because I can, I guess I'm paid to preach sometimes. When angels show up in the Bible, they don't give them a hug. They fall off their feet as one dead, it says in Daniel. Being in the presence of God is scary. I'm not saying you can't be happy in God's presence. It's just striking to me that these charismatic movements of the church in the several decades that we equate joy and laughter and dancing because of a couple lines from David and Psalms and so forth. But we did, I know I'm in God's presence because I just got so happy. And I'm, again, I'm all for happiness. But they never talk about the fact that I know God was here because everyone was lying on their face repenting. And that's biblical too. But it's, it is biblical. So anyway, sometimes it's encouraging, sometimes it's challenging. Uh, but it is. Again, one more time. If I pull back the curtains and go, what's going on up there? And I saw certain images, those images will either comfort me or really convict me. And that's what apocalyptic literature attempts to do. That's what it tries to do. In very wild symbolism. In fact, by the way, of all the apocalyptic texts I ever read, and this is generally believed, Revelation has the most amount of imagery. It's the craziest sounding of all of them. Yay, made it to our Bible. Revelation did went off, by the way, if you didn't know this, uh, that the New, the New Testament documents were being collected. It took a few centuries for certain documents to be included. And now, if you have your Bible in front of you now, you say, well, I've got 66 books, Protestant canon, probably. You have the New Interpreter Study Bible, my favorite, which is one and two left for sale. You've got more than 66. But anyway, the book of Revelation, so the Apocalypse... We also call the Apocalypse of John. In the Eastern Church, in the Orthodox Church, it was not accepted as canonical to be put in the Bible 
until the 8th century. For 700 years, they went, eh. They liked a different apocalypse better. The apocalypse of Peter. That was very popular in a lot of churches, the apocalypse of Peter. That, that dot dot means whatever comes from above it. So I'm just saving time, but... It, what? Nothing. Yeah, Apocalypse of Peter. And you can read it. It's a little more fun because the Apocalypse of Peter, people in heaven, the heavenly realm, they look down and see people getting through pain in hell, makes them happy. Like, whoa, I can see and burn. But they kind of like that more. You don't, That's not our revelation, Apocalypse. No. But there are other Apocalypses. All right, I'm going to go there in just a second. Where did this come from? Some kind of perceived crisis. That's why people wrote these things some kind of crisis. Either it was a political enemy, a religious enemy, some kind of enemy, and that's what happened, and it seems to be the case. So, any questions or comments about the genre and what, I, what I'm talking about? Anything at all? Why did they uh, pronounce it genre and make this letter E, G-E-N? <laughs> oh, the uh, genre with a... Well, like, a, like the Apostle John, you know, when you say... Oh, right, because John, it comes from the French language. Oh. Genre. Or something like that. Yeah, it comes from the French language. That's my best French I got. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good question. You're saying that that genre is no longer, it's only in about that 700 years? Correct. There might be some people on the planet today who write that way. I don't know of any. So as a, as a recognizable genre, most scholars would say it's a dead genre. And most people would say, no, like no Christian, no normal person today writes about the dominance of a political power above them as apocalypse. No one does that anymore. I guess just it, it came to my mind. I started thinking of like, um, what were those Mel Gibson movies? You know, the Beyond Thunderdome, all the apocalyptic. Oh, oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. and of course, like there's the Book of Eli, which. Oh, I love that. I loved it too. But I mean, you know, those all that are. What we think of being the end of times or apocalyptic. I'm so glad you brought that up. Can I? Yeah, can I jump in there right there? Yes. Good, very good. Yes. yes, I'm so glad you brought that up. Apocalypse with the se. All right, that's the noun. Apocalyptic is the adjective. Today in modern English, everybody's wrong. If you're talking about with scholars, scholars mean apocalyptic literature. They mean what I just read. That definition, and it's a hybrid from uh, from uh, is it J J uh, J J Adela, Adela Yarbrough Collins? Uh, she teaches. I think she's still at Yale. Uh, they're I think they're spouses anyway. They're New Testament scholars. Uh, that's the standard scholarly definition. Today, when American or English speaking people say it was apocalyptic, they mean usually post World War Three. Yeah. The exact like Book of Eli is a perfect example. Of course, yeah. Denzel Washington is a devout Christian. Denzel Washington. Which is kind of bizarre. His roles can be pretty dark. Yeah, pretty dark. Um, but he almost became a pastor. His dad was a pastor. And so, yeah, the book, of course, Eli is actually is Eli. Eli in Hebrew means my God. So the book of my God. So anyway, that's an example. So it's horrible if you've never seen the movie. Or yeah, uh, Mad Max and Thunderdome, all yeah. those. Yeah, it's apocalyptic because it's so destitute. That's right. That's and a, there's so many of them. Yes. Like ones that I've not even watched, but I've heard of. Like the yes. end, like everything we know of yes. is gone. Yes, right. Exactly but right. But yet there's still humans trying to start over again. Right. That's exactly right. That's exactly what I don't mean. Okay. Is that, <laughs> so that, I'm so glad you brought that up. I'm serious because that is not at all what I mean. This is nothing. The apocalypse genre has nothing to do with World War Three, or we can't find oil anymore. Russia and the Pope—I mean, all that stuff. That dis- no, not at all. Well, Thank another you. one that I thought. Then, what about as far as writing goes? Would that be like Pilgrim's Progress? That's almost. Uh, yeah, not. Po- yeah, that. Yeah, no. Correct, but no. Like, what genre would that fit in? Well, that's uh, a, a myth. More like a. Well, that's a different thing. Yeah, let me think about that for a second. It's not apocalyptic. Okay. The author doesn't think he's getting a vision by God to go on a... a, a cause, mm-hmm. Because we're going to a second. Because one thing is key. The key thing of apocalyptic literature, all the symbolism, whatever, it's always about end times. Okay. It's always going to happen at the end of time. Okay. And and I'll talk a lot more about that in just a uh, little tonight, a little bit. Um, 
And that's called eschatology. And that's about end times, end times. It's always about end times. Which tells me right off the bat that there's only three different, really, okay, three, maybe four religions that even can talk about end of time. Only three, maybe four. Of course, Judaism. And of course, Christianity. And Islam. And then maybe Zoroastrianism. Maybe Zoroastrianism. Okay, that's a Persian religion if you don't know. It's real. Okay, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Zoro Zoroastrianism. Uh, these are the only three, maybe four, in the whole world of existence for which we have evidence at all that believes time is linear. But time began, and time will come to an end, a big cataclysmic ending. Nobody else believes that. I mean, atheists might as a naturalist, that, but that's a different, I'm talking about no religion. Everybody else, billions of people on the globe, Buddhists, uh, Shinto, probably, yeah, certainly, certainly Hindus, the uh, time is uh, cyclical, over and over and over. So now are we born, and then we live and die and get reborn, it's called samsara. Not only do we do this, we're all stuck in samsara, the universe is also part of it. The universe itself goes and boom, over and over and over and over. So they don't have apocalyptic in the same way that we do. We got the market cornered, particularly Jews and Christians. Jews and Christians are the only people who ever wrote this genre. And today it's a dead genre. I'm so glad you brought that. This is not about Mel Gibson. You might be a little crazy, but I love him. But this is not about... Yeah. yeah. They'll see the movie description, apocalyptic thriller. That's great, but that's nothing to do with what we're talking about. I'm glad. Any other questions or comments? So glad. Anything else? Anything else? Do you see why, so far, why I won't do dispensationalism? Because dispensationalists do not start with the question, what kind of genre is this? How do I read this in historical literary context? They don't start there. They start with a broad theological blueprint schema and figure out how it fits into it. Right. In general, they say that's not fair, but in general, I think that's quite fair. I think it is. Um, but that's not what I do and no one else does. The first question is, what kind of text is it? And you go, oh, now, what are the, uh, my wife would say, the reading clues for her kindergartners? What are, the, what are the clues that let me know how to read the text? And there are all kinds of clues that tell me this fits a kind of pattern of reading. And tonight, we'll get into it some, and the handout gets a lot of, there are patterns. And that's why I said early on, when you become an expert, I looked at you, June, when you become an apocalyptic expert, you'll go, now I get it. Every single time I see the number 10, I know what that means now. Every time there's a white horse, now I know what white means. You little keys on like, no, I get it. It's starting to make a lot more sense. Oh, red, red means pestilence. Okay, black means death or pestilence. I get it. Or you just start seeing these patterns over and over. It's a loud voice like thunder, of course. That means authoritative. Oh, the beast has a horn. Horns equal a, a, a government, a power. So you just see patterns. Why? Because it's a genre. People go, wink, wink, we get it. But if you're a Roman and you pick up this manuscript and you're reading Revelation, you sound like a bunch of crazy people. They're talking about. Gog and Magog? That's reference in Ezekiel. But dude, they've been gone a long time ago, dummy. What are these dumb people talking about? They're all going, hee, 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 hee. We're talking about you. Babylon will fall. Dummy, Babylon's been falling for centuries. They go, hee, hee, you're a Babylon room. Dummy. I, I'm doing this on purpose so that I, I mean, like the, thinking of the French, French resistance during Hitler or something. They have code words. That's the point. A lot of this was just code so that people wouldn't realize what's going on. If you're on the inside, you know exactly what's going on because you know the literature. Mm -hmm. Jews and Christians know it. Pagans don't know it. They don't write that way. So, I'll move ahead. Any questions or comments or not, I'll move ahead. If you're already experts, this is great. <laughs> Whatever. They're just sleeping drinking all the sugar over there, so I'm not right. I have to sit here and watch them eat. Oh, no, thank you guys. <laughs> I'm in a form of Jewish hell right now. This is what... <laughs> <laughs> she said, mmm, mm, that's tasty. Awful. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> Carl Diane cracks me up. She is funny. Okay. Jewish apocalypses. I'm just giving you a list of these in case if you're, you know, you want to go and impress your parents at home. I don't know. Apocalypse of Abraham. Does that mean he wrote one? No, it doesn't mean that. This was written around the year, if I recall, 200 B.C. People wrote them in famous people's names on purpose all the time. Little footnote. 
That's something very weird about the Apocalypse of John. It was not written pseudonymously. That is with a false name. Every scholar thinks John the prophet wrote this. We'll talk about that later. John, not John the Apostle, but John the prophet. That's weird. Almost every apocalypse, apocalypse was written in a, a false name, and his was not. Apocalypse of Abraham, Apocalypse of Adam, Apocalypse of Baruch. Baruch was Isaiah's sidekick. That's in Greek. Uh, Baruch is a Syriac version, a Greek version. The Apocalypse of Daniel, Daniel. This is the Hebrew. Apocalypse of Daniel, which is in Greek. The Apocalypse of Elijah, of Ezra, of Gabriel's Revelation, blah, 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 blah. There's all of them. You can go read them. Do a Google search. I think they're all translated to English by now. I think they are. And then there are some apocalyptic sections in the Old Testament. For example, example Daniel 7, 1 through, 7 to 12. 1 through 6 is about the Daniel you know and love. If you know your Daniel story, he's caught in the lion's den and da-da-da-da-da. Then 7 to 12, all things get crazy. I mean, the imagery, the everything. And so, so there are strong... I'm being, okay, I'm always honest. I'm not being mean. I'm just, and I don't like all labels, but sometimes labels save time. Strong conservative scholars think all of Daniel was written by a prophet named Daniel. And that's fine. That's fine. Everyone else disagrees. Almost all scholars say, no, no, Daniel 1 through 6 probably does go back to a historical prophetic figure. But Daniel 7 through 12 was probably written a long time after that Daniel was dead. And it's an apocalyptic session probably written around the year 165 B.C. Um, there you go. And I have this on your handout. But anyway, that's apocalyptic. And you can tell. You just read your own Bible. You'll see what I'm talking about. Read Daniel 6 and read 7. You'll see what just, you got on crack. The, the language, the imagery is very different. It's Hebrew crack. It's different. Uh, Ezekiel 40 to 48 is a proto-apocalyptic. Proto means, of course, from the Latin, from the Greek, which means uh, like early. It's early forms of it. Early forms. Zechariah 1 to 6 is a proto apocalyptic. So some of it is in the Old Testament, but that's really it. Those three sections. Now that matters because if this were a thorough class in Revelation and you were really paying top dollar for this class, we'd go through all that. But you're not paying me junk. And so. I paid you. I, I paid you. <laughs> You'll get tutored. You're getting more good. You're going to get tutored. I'm paying you in sugar. Oh. <laughs> So my homework is, I'm serious, my homework is if you really want to help yourself understand this better, I'm serious, if you really do want, if not, that's fine, it's between you and God, whatever. If you really want to help get better at this, read these texts I'm mentioning. Because, one, they're there. Two, the author of Revelation absolutely steals from these texts all the time. You're talking about Daniel and Daniel yes, and Zechariah. Yes, ma'am, right at the bottom of page one, exactly right. He loves them texts. He knows these texts very well. So oftentimes... When we go through Revelation in the commentaries, you'll see, this is quoting Daniel 7, this is quoting Daniel 7, this is quoting Ezekiel 37, this is quoting Daniel. It's like, err, it's not a lot of original stuff. He takes some of the material and fashions it to a new way. He does some of that, but it, he, he borrows a lot of it. So in his dream, his vision is borrowing a whole lot of Old Testament imagery. I mean, really, so a lot of stuff will make sense. Um, if you read that. So then there's something called the Dead Sea Scrolls. It has a lot of apocalyptic sections. The Sons of Light will be led by Michael, Mikael. The Prince of Light against the Sons of Darkness led by Belial and the Angel of Darkness. He's the Angel of Darkness. That sounds apocalyptic. Oh, and then the New Testament. Okay. Revelation is an apocalypse and it's apocalyptic vocabulary and style written as a prophecy in the form of a letter. You're welcome. I didn't write it. But if you read it from top to bottom, it's in the genre, the big genre of letter. It's got an intro person. We'll talk about this starting next week. Intro, the letters of uh, churches of seven churches of Asia Minor. It has an ending just like a letter. But he calls it a prophecy. He's God's messenger. But then his prophecy is almost all in the form of poetry, and it's apocalyptic poetry. So it's a mixture of all those things. Mark 13 in parallel. So Mark 13 is in Matthew 24, Luke 21. Remember that Mark 13 called the Olivet Discourse? Again, because at time, I want you to, if I encourage you, go back and read these. You'll see it. Now I see it. I see a lot of patterns right now. Mark 13, Jesus, the disciples come up to Jesus and say, man, they, they just finished the Pesach, the Passover meal. Jesus, look at the temple. They're talking about the temple built under Herod, which was chiefly under construction in that time period. The temple was finished construction around the year 80, 60-ish, 
and then it was destroyed about five, six years later. At the time of Jesus, it was mostly put up, but still in the construction. And the stones they use, and you can go to Egypt right now and see this gigantic, they'll have stones half the size of this wall, and they're like 2,000 tons a piece. They're gigantic. And the temple had huge stones. And the disciples say, Jesus, look at those large stones. Like, this is huge. It's amazing. It's also a way of implying, isn't this great? Because we want the temple to be built so God's glory will come back and fill the temple and he's going to restore Israel. Whoa! And Jesus goes, high five, you're right. It's going to happen tomorrow. That's not what he does at all. Jesus does not say high five. You know your Bible. He says, you see those stones? Not one of them will last stand upon the other. The point is, they're going to be destroyed. It's going to be toppled down. They go, what? What? When will this happen? And Jesus never answers the question. In fact, he takes that question and answers two different things. One is, signs you'll know the temple's about to be destroyed. And then signs of his return. And Mark and Matthew and Luke intertwine inter intertwine these two. And that's why people get confused. We're talking about two different events. Two different events. And that makes sense, though, because that's such a cataclysmic thing that surely that's going to end of time. Um, and Jesus says, when that happens, blah, blah, blah. But in that day, the sun will be darkened, the moon will turn to blood, and when the Son of Man comes, he will gather the elect and the angels. Blah, blah. That's end times apocalyptic stuff. The other stuff just means the temple will fall. And that was apocalyptic sounding. Uh, and then I'm going to stop. 1 Thessalonians 4 will come back. 1 Corinthians 15 has some sections. 2 Thessalonians. So let's, for fun, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So go back in your Bible just a little bit to 1 or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I said a second ago, I won't talk about dispensation in the month, except what I need to, and I'm going to need to here in just a second to make the point about, we'll talk about rapture here in a second, or the lack thereof. Because okay, this is the main place where people go to argue for rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. No, this is too fast. My pace is okay. It's okay. Take your time. 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 13. Uh, chapter 4, verse 13. Take your time. When you start reading the genre, and, and, and don't, don't ever be afraid to look at your table of contents, your Bible app, take your time, find it. I'm just trying to give you encouragement. If you will take some time to read what I've put on this handout, these, these, these scripture references, you'll start seeing that they read differently than other things. Jesus does not usually walk around Galilee saying, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed and da-da-da-da-da, and the moon will turn to blood and the sun will be dark and the stars will fall. He doesn't talk that way. He just doesn't. He'll say, it's like the fisherman went out to fish. It's normal agrarian farmer fishing vocabulary. But then when he starts talking about moons and suns and blood, and like, whoa, what? it's such a bizarre word. What? That's apocalyptic. It stands out. And you'll get better at that. You'll start reading it more and go, ah, if it's apocalyptic, I'm not supposed to be asking what kind of butterfly is it? I'll miss the point. I'm supposed to be asking how does it make me feel? What truth is it trying to convey? This is a section of the case in point. So in the chapter 4, and 1 Thessalonians, so this is from the Apostle Paul writing to a church that's in a town called Thessaloniki, Thessaloniki, which you can go to today. In fact, the ruins are still there. It's, a, it's pretty cool. I've been there. I don't know. You can go there, and let me start in verse, verse 9, because this is, sounds like a letter. Paul, the normal human dude, is writing to another human, verse 9, so 4 or 9. But concerning love of the brethren, that's Christians, you have no need to have anyone write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do love all the brethren throughout all Macedonia. But we beg you, brethren, to do so more and more, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands as we charge you, so that you may command the respect of outsiders, he means Gentile pagans, and be dependent on nobody. Don't be a lazy nobody. Do you know how normal that sounds? It's a letter. As a pastor telling his people. Then verse 13, things are going to start sounding a bit different. But we would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep. Now, of course, that's a metaphor for people who have died because they look like they're asleep. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. That's a very big concept in Christianity, hope that Jesus will return and we get a resurrected body. 
they grieve like people. Oh my goodness, the despair. You ought to look at Roman epitaphs on tombs. A very common, it was so common to say this, they turned it to a Latin acronym. The saying was, I was, I am not, so what? Yeah, it's not very hopeful. One epitaph said, as you come upon this grave, weep. I use that when I do graveside services. And I say, but what do you think about when you see a tomb? When you see a graveside? Christians see and see hope. That is, every time I see a tomb, I'm reminded, I'm sad they're not here, but they're not here either, right? They're not here. The bodies are decaying, but they're not here. That's Christian. Pagans don't have a hope like that. Non-Christians, non-Jews. Okay. He says, I don't want you to agree like they do. Verse 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we sure do, even so through Jesus, God the Father will bring with him to earth, that's his point, to earth, those who have fallen asleep. So once they've died, he's saying Jesus, God will bring with Jesus back to earth everybody who's died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, he means that, like a prophetic utterance, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. That is to say, when Jesus returns, those who are alive won't. When he's coming down to earth, if I'm sitting here alive, God won't make sure I leave the ground to meet him. No, not first. Verse 16, I won't be first. Someone else will be first. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the archangel's call and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Now we're going back to Exodus 19. All the way back to Acts 19, 16 to 19, where Moses calls out the trumpet of God. His trumpet, of course, when, as, as to say God's declaration. And the dead in Christ will rise first. The, the Greek can be the dead in Christ will rise first, or it can be in Christ, the dead will rise first. And translations go back and forth. The point is, those who are dead, who are Christians, they'll rise first to meet Jesus as he descends to earth. Verse 17, then... We who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, we who are alive are left are caught together within the clouds. It's verse 17. That's some people say that's clearly the rapture. But again, I'm not going to go on and on about that. This is not rapture theology where we've got to get out of the way. Every scholar agrees that what, what Paul has in mind here is that that you know we're on earth, that Jesus is coming back down to earth, to earth, that those who are dead, let's assume this is a tomb for a second, he'll make sure they rise up to meet him first as he comes down to earth. And together, they'll all come down to earth as it were. And they're all smiling. As he goes to make a new heavens and new earth, he's going to make something brand new. Paul's encouragement to them is the fact that certain Thessalonians, and there's several, I'm saving a lot of time, there's certain Christians who are in the Thessaloniki who are sad and scared because Paul comes there and he's preaching. You know, give your life to Jesus. Jesus is amazing. He's died on the cross and on and on. And he'll come back. He does his church plant and he leaves. And then he leaves and some people in the church start dying. So what in the world do we do? You said Jesus is coming back, but Aunt Lucy died. What am I going to do now? Did God forget her? But if he comes back, what if Jesus forgets? Paul writes a letter. No, 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 no. No, you're grieving with absolute despair like he's going to forget your Aunt Boosie. No, he's not. That's not how it works. And he gives apocalyptic vocabulary, this heavy imagery all of a sudden, instead of love people. And all of a sudden it's cry, command, and trumpet, and this or that. He said, no, 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 no. The dead in Christ are right first. They'll meet him as he comes. And so this fits a very common motif of what really happened in the Roman world when royalty came to a town. Today, if uh, Biden came to town, the people they would ask to go meet him as he came to Kiwani would not be I. Or they'd say, I need the pastor at Hill Church. Or they wouldn't, they wouldn't ask normal people either. The first people in town probably would be, of course, the governor, right? Maybe the mayors. It's going to be dignitaries, the important people to meet him at the airport. And hi, oh, nice to meet you. I'm the guy with the 14 mask on. Or and they go down. Oh, God, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. They'll hate me. 13 masks. So they, and that made may the Kiwani and people know people, whoa, hey, what's up? But I'm a, I'm a lowly person. Everybody in the ancient world, there's nothing new about that. There's nothing new. It's all been around forever. And what virtually all New Testament scholars agree is that's Paul's point here. Christians will be those important people to meet Jesus, the royalty, as he comes to town. 
Don't be sad and afraid that God has forgotten your dead relatives. He's not forgotten them. I'm crying out loud, he's not forgotten them. They'll be guests of honor. Don't worry about all this stuff. They'll be guests of honor. Now, it's not to meet the Lord as they go away to heaven. Meet the Lord as he's coming. There is a particular word. So there are two words that the New Testament likes to use for Jesus' return. Well, there's a few, but there's two. One major one. Another one is something else. And I won't tell you, well, I will tell you the Greek on one because this is that important. The Greek on one is, is uh, parousia or parousia, but parousia. In Greek, that means, it can mean arrival, it can mean appearing, um, it can mean, that's really it, that's what it means. Something like arrival or appearing. Presence, it can mean presence, it could mean someone's presence somehow. And that's not a magical word. It's not a Jesus-only term. Paul always say the term when he's writing to a church. It just means in my arrival, my appearing. That's the number one way they like to talk about Jesus' return. It's not rapture because Latin doesn't make any sense. This is the biblical term they like to use. When is arrival? His arrival. The second most common term, just for, in English, is um, is revealing, when, or when Jesus is revealed. When Jesus is revealed, when, G, when Jesus, and that's a very, so from the term, the, from the root word for apocalypse. And it is not an image of Jesus floating through the cumulus clouds. There he is. Poor old Asians can't see him. Poor old Canadians can't see him because he's only going to be in this time zone of Israel. I mean, I don't know. At least, I'm sorry, for me that's, uh, that's not the point of the New Testament. The revealing is all of a sudden he appears. Much like, right, I can unzip reality right here and out he pops. And the image, of course, is one that happened. That's it. Age, this age is over. That is the end of time. That's the end of time. Yeah. So when does that happen? When does it happen? Next uh, Tuesday. So. <laughs> according to you. Get ready. I have no. According to me, when does it happen? Oh Lord, I have no idea. According to the scriptures, when 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 will this? Good. Jesus didn't know. So I don't guess. Jesus said in Mark thirteen, not even the Son or the angels, only the Father knows when that day I am. In fact, that's what's so important in Mark 13. That's the great irony is the right word there. The great irony is people who like charts and flow charts and timetables and the blood moon and clearly, 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 they are absolutely going against the teaching of Jesus. Jesus said, Don't, when you hear of wars or rumors of wars, it's not the end yet. Don't get caught up on speculating. Instead, what Jesus, Jesus says is, not David, he says, watch out. Be, be vigilant. He said, you do not know the hour. Paul says it like this in 1 Thessalonians, or in 1 Corinthians 2. It's like a, it'll come like a thief in the night. So is he going to put his foot on the Mount of Olives when he comes back? Into the foot on the Mount of Olives. I don't know. You're going to hear me say that a lot. I don't know. My view is no. My view is that when Jesus returns, that there's going to be a brand new new heavens and earth. That this earth won't matter anymore. So what about the, thought, uh, the millennial reign? When's that start? Uh, yeah, that's next Thursday. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I've got... Two pages on that exact topic. So that's a great question. Is it okay if we postpone that? Is it okay? Yeah. And then the people in the grave, are they, that's physically there, correct? Because Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So when we, if we're in Christ and we die, and I'm 68, so I'm looking, that could be soon, physically. But spiritually, I'm in Christ. So when I physically die, I'll be with the Lord, correct? That is the standard Christian view. So the people, this is... They're not literally in the grave. Right. They're, right, that's why I'm just, I'm saying those who are dead. So when Christ... But, but Paul, the reason why I did this is because, and this is, this is where the, this is a great discussion and dialogue and question, because this is where the language of apocalyptic gets very difficult to pin down, because sometimes it gets dangerously close to like asking, which kind of butterfly is it? And so I'll keep saying, I'm not sure if that's the way to interpret it, or I'll say, I don't know. And the reason why I said they will come up is because Paul said they will raise up, they will rise up. Use that vocabulary, go up. And so if I think about press Paul on that, say, wait a second, you think they're down in the grave? I think he'd say, I don't think so, but there's a common Jewish way of understanding the dead are in the abode, which is below the earth. <clears throat> Sheol is a below the earth. And you and say, but Paul, you said to the Corinthians that, to be present, and in Philippians too, that you want to be present with, you'll be present with the Lord. 
And I think he said, well, yeah. We'll say, but why'd you say they'll rise up? And they'll say, because that's, I, I don't know what he'd say. I think he'd say is, because that made sense that people think that when they're dead, they're dead. I think I can bury them and they're going to raise up. Well, where's my loved one right now? And with Jesus. Do you think they're down there? I'm going to follow and say yes or no. I mean, I, because that language immediately becomes metaphorical and poetic, and I, I'm not real sure. Yeah, because you're referring to the oppose that it talks about in the Old Testament. Correct. Abraham's bosom, and then uh, uh, not hell, but uh, Hades. And so, is anybody in Abraham's bosom? Great, uh, correct. And I did talk a lot about that in uh, one of the How to Read the Bible for All Study class on Facebook. I did a lot more on that than I do right, what I do right now, which is, yeah, in the Old Testament, they apparently had no concept of heaven or hell. None. Ancient Hebrews believe that everybody dies. Everyone who died has the same destiny. Everyone went to Sheol. Everyone did. And sometimes Sheol is a metaphor for the grave, but oftentimes it's used, they treat it like it's a real location under the earth where their dead ancestors live on. But they live on in this like shadowy existence. The bummer of being in Sheol is not that it's suffering. The bummer of being in Sheol, and the psalmist would say, is because you can't go to the temple anymore. That's why it's a bummer. But you're there with your ancestors. So much so, that's why the witch of Endor can pull up Samuel and say, Shaul, Saul, and say, I can bring him up from these, these, these pits. And you're like, leave me alone. What do you want with me? I'm busy being dead. So they give a metaphor in Abraham's bosom. Whatever that, it's a metaphor. I mean, what does that mean? They don't think they live inside Abraham's stomach. That doesn't make... Surely they just mean it's a metaphor for the place where dead people go. They say there was 400 years before the law was given, you know, everything was given to the Jewish nation. Abraham believed God was reckoned to his righteousness. Right? In Genesis. Right. So the idea of what follows is and in Romans it talks about the gospel is preached to Abraham. In Galatians it talks about that. Yeah. That that in other words, the from because wasn't it Abel who brought the more perfect sacrifice, the blood sacrifice? And Cain brought the work of his hands, which represents two different now I don't know how you relate that apocalyptic. Right. And I don't know either. I don't know how that is related. But well, it's a good point good. about Abraham, and if I move on just because of, because of time, uh, it's true that Paul in Galatians talks about Abraham and, and righteousness and the gospel. But surely Paul doesn't think Abraham gave his life to Jesus. The point Paul's making, and it's a very particular point, in fact, he makes a point that no other Jew would agree with him on, which is, the point of Abraham being reckoned righteousness is that he believed God. He trusted them and said, I'll go do it. No other Jew of the time period interpreted Genesis that way. Every other Jew for which we have evidence said that's not what common aggression is at all. It's the fact that he did something about it. It was his behavior that was righteousness. And Paul said, no, no, no. It was just his faith. And Paul needs to make that point because he's talking to Jewish interlocutors and say that's what faith in Jesus that's what he's drawing the connecting the dots. So Jewish friends of Paul would have gone, you've gone crazy. Paul, nobody interprets it that way. And he said, well, I am, because we all know that's the real gospel. You just have to believe that Jesus who he is and give your life to him. It's not about works at all. Uh, that's right. But in the Old Testament, there's no indication they believe anybody went to heaven or hell. And that's why it's such a very common misconception because it's pre preached and taught all the time that they talk about heaven and hell. That it's not in the Old Testament. You, you didn't get punished. To be punished by God to a Jew is to be kicked out of the community. They were exiled from their covenant. That's a bad deal. Or they were killed, either stoned or kicked out. That was their punishment. Not they go to hell. It was not. So there was no salvation for sins like that. They didn't think that way. The sacrificial system was not about going to heaven. Uh, the New Testament, we have these concepts, but not in the Old Testament. Yeah, because uh, the book of Acts, chapter 7, uh, Stephen identifies the nation of Israel, what they were given responsibility for. And 
he, he told the Sanhedrin right to their faces, saying, you were the ones who put to death the prophets. You're doing just as your father did. Your father, you killed the prophets and so on. And they were cut to the quick. They were convicted because they knew that uh, Stephen was presenting this whole thing as a... Yeah. The thing, you know, you were talking about how it weaves together. This whole thing is salvation. And, and they, they were rejected. Yeah, maybe. And maybe after the class we can talk more well, about that. That's something, you know, about, you know, what you're talking about, how that you tie in. Because wouldn't, from the beginning to the end, it's all about the blood of Christ. Just like the blood that was put about the old post, the blood of Christ, you know, Passover and so on. So they knew that that, had, that was important in the Old Testament and weaved right on into the New Testament. Yeah. So how that maybe. relates to the gender of the uh, article yeah, to the prophecy and revelation, how that all ties in and how it's going to end up. Maybe I, I, I just, I'm always almost upset when I'm teasing. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't look for patterns. I'm very suspicious of them until there's evidence for it, because I, on my view, is that we should read every single text just as it attacks itself and let them speak for themselves. So, for example, if the author of Revelation ties in an analogy or a throwback to something in Exodus of the blood over the lamb, but the, the lamb blood over the door, and that's what he does, and I'll go, that's what John did. I won't go to Revelation looking for a tie-in. I'll make sure I want to hear what he has to say first before my trying to put on top of it some uh, schema. But, but is the unity of the gospel mm-hmm. through the power of the Holy Spirit, speak, God speaking through men, that same, it doesn't change, that we're saved by grace apart from works in the law. And throughout this whole Bible, from the beginning to the end, nobody's going to be, basically nobody's going to be walking through the pearly gates without the blood. I agree with that. No one will. Well, this is the pearly gates. Yeah, that's right. We'll put it this way. Yeah. To, to, to be in the presence of yeah. Almighty. I think if someone's forgiven, they're forgiven of what Jesus has done. Yeah, the redemptive work of Christ. Yeah, that I think that's that's New Testament. There's basic theology that if someone's forgiven, they're forgiven of Jesus. That doesn't mean they have to be consciously aware of it. I like to think Abraham is going to be in the presence of Jesus. He never met Jesus. He didn't believe in the cross. He wasn't a Christian. He knew Yeshua. He knew about Yeshua. Okay, maybe after class you can convince me that Abraham knew who Jesus was. But he knew he knew the he knew the plan of salvation. Okay. Maybe after class you can convince me of that. Well I've never I can only go by this what you know, I'm like you. I wanna I wanna see it in here. Oh good. Well we have that comment. But yeah, I didn't mean I think path. I was just kind of That's right. No, hey, it's good. It's uh, hopefully, thing. Yeah, I don't think Jesus is anywhere in the Old Testament. At all. I think the incarnation was a very special event in the history of the universe. And that only happened in Bethlehem. That's when it first commenced. I think Jesus was nowhere in the Old Testament. Is Yeshua a Hebrew word? It is. Yeshua. Yeshua. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Which, what's that mean in Greek? Well, the same thing it means in Hebrew. Yahweh saves. It means Yahweh saves. So So the word, our word Joshua is Yeshua. So the whole idea of saving, salvation. Yes, but on the policy, I can move on. But yes, the problem is Christians like to import salvation to mean we start dreaming up things where it's like heaven and hell and saving from sins. That is not what Jews thought when they used the word saved. That is not what they meant. I can prove that over and over and over and over. When Isaiah tells the people God will save you, he doesn't mean you won't go to hell. That is not what he means. He'll mean you'll get your land back, your cattle back, like when you do a record backwards in a country song, get your dog back, your truck back. That's what you'll get back in the Led Zeppelin backwards. Led Zeppelin backwards, yeah. They, he does not mean you don't go to hell. He means you'll get your land back, your crops back, and babies back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. David, are you, when you say that... Say what? When, when, when you were just explaining to him, we're talking about what, what the Jewish people versus what we today believe. Is that, I mean, because the Orthodox Jew... Vision hasn't changed much over 2,000 years, but 
32 documents. It doesn't change much. It basically starts as this idea that the state had an idea all the way through tradition. Is that right? Does that make sense? I think so. You mean salvation through Jesus? Through, 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 through the whole, the, the Jewish faith, the Jewish religious idea has not changed much over 3,000 years. Oh, uh, no, yeah, brother, I would disagree with that. Yeah, yeah. There's some fundamentals they haven't changed at all, like the monotheistic, one God only. But the nuances, like nowadays, most Jewish thinkers very much would argue for a place called like heaven. They won't call it that. They'll call it the world to come, which is why I typically use that expression, by the way. And they'll talk about a hell. But it, the Christians basically go to them on to think that way. That was more of a Christian idea. I mean, it's Jewish, but I'm pointing out the long story. But they did not think that way in the Old Testament. So, so on that exact point, so you talk about unity in the whole Bible and so forth. What Christians historically have said around 2,000 years, Christian thinkers argue what's called progressive revelation that God reveals himself over time more and more and more. And that's part of my sermon series now, which I know you've memorized, uh, is that God forms people, right? The Abraham, Abraham, da, 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 and he slowly reveals. So, so, so God allowed, Yahweh allowed the ancient Israelites for centuries to have no idea about what was coming. He was okay with that. Just like he had no idea with them think about, there was a place called Alaska or Mexico. They didn't know that. Hebrews didn't know what a hurricane was. They never experienced one. They were ignorant about a whole bunch of things. God was like, I'm okay with that. I'll reveal myself over time. And by the time we get to the New Testament with Jesus, then we have more beliefs. Absolutely. And so that's why I don't go backwards in the Old Testament and say, it's all about Jesus. I'd say, ooh, that makes me nervous because I, I think that's unfair to the Old Testament. I know that is normal in churches. I know it's normal for Christians to say that. I have no problem saying the Old Testament points toward that. I preach that. I have no problem. But to think that the, all of it's about the blood of Jesus, I don't find it persuasive. I don't. And secondly, I think it can be a way to misread a lot of Old Testament text. And I'm going to read it for their sake because I think it's authoritative on its own and then uh, and so forth. So I'll, I'll go on by it. Yes, ma'am. I'm just saying. I'm kidding. By the way, that's what today, to, to this day, uh, that's why so many Jewish widows in Israel because it's very, and Christians do the same thing. But when they die, particularly their husbands almost always die first, they fly them all over to Israel to be buried in Israel. A lot of Christians do it because they're convinced Jesus will return to Israel first. And so they want the dead and rise to be first to be the first one on the ground. So they have tombstones everywhere. And That's why it's that hill right there. It's like yeah, the hills, each other, talking people. to each other, talking to each other. Yeah. yeah, if you're, thank you for that, yeah. If that's an implicit question about what I think about how it's restored, if it, if, if you care at all, my response is I don't know. Yeah, so I don't know. That's a good question. I, I don't know. I know that Paul did argue in 1 Corinthians 15 very much that we do get a new body. He was very adamant about that point. Um, so when and where that happens, I, I, well, I don't know. Yeah, good question. We do get one. Anybody else? Or oh, that question, it was a good point. I don't want to bring a jar up here. I'm, no, that's good. Anybody else? Anybody else? Time has flown when you're having fun. Uh, if we kept going on and on. Oh, let me go on chapter five. So just real quickly, chapter five. But as to the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need to have anything written to you. Like, yeah, we do, Paul. For you yourselves know well that the day of the Lord, that's the Yom Adonai, that's an Old Testament prophetic idea. That means judgment day. Day of the Lord is judgment day. You can just put that in your Bible if you want. And Paul joins together the Yom Adonai, the day of the Lord, with Jesus' return. He makes those the same day. So in the Old Testament, there is no Jesus, but Amos talks about the day of the Lord. He says, woe to you, though you are longing for the day of the Lord. It won't be happy. It's going to be sad for you. That is, you Jewish leaders are going, why won't God come rescue us? He's like, you don't want that because when he shows up, you're in trouble. Paul takes that same day and, and conflates it with the return of Jesus. That day will come like a thief in the night. And people say there's peace and security and sudden destruction will come upon them as a Travail comes upon a woman with a child, like all of a sudden, she's, boom, time to have the baby. But you are not in darkness, brethren, the, day, uh, the sons of the day, no, 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 let us be awake and sober and beyond. There's tons of good apocalyptic metaphors. Love it. And then verse 11, encourage one another. So you can read more about that if you want. And I'm going to show my hand out real quickly at the top. And then after, uh, outside of those apocalypses I just told you, so Revelation and all that I just told you, Top page two. You can also read the Apocalypse of James. There's two versions: James the first, James the second. Apocalypse of Elias and Methodius of Paul. Paul is a Coptic version. 
Apologies of Peter, a Gnostic version, a Greek version, and on and on. Again, you can read these. All of these, besides the Gospel of Peter, they weren't that popular. They were written, but they weren't in the early church. But some were pretty popular. But the one that won the day is the one you and I have in our New Testament, which is the Apocalypse of John. And it then there are different. 700 years. Rough, four to 500. Rough 200 BC, roughly to 200 AD, roughly four or five years. And that's it. After that, it just kind of. It's scattered out here and there once in a while, maybe four, fifth, sixth century, but a couple, but it just died off. Just died off. And then there's otherworldly journeys with or without a journey. If you do an otherworldly journey, they talk a lot about heaven, hell, heavenly bodies, order, God's control of earthly, otherworldly, otherworldly. If there's not an otherworldly journey, it's temporal aspects, an angel interpreting a message in a dream or vision, signs of the times. That sounds like Mark 13. Right, Jesus says you're going to see this and that. Or 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, they'll talk about that stuff. Jesus says there'll be earthquakes and famines and bears, oh my. Right? Humans will have wars with each other. Um, there you go. And then they'll talk about events that already happened as if they're going to happen. It makes it sound very authoritative. We call those ex eventual prophecies. Uh, I'm going to pause there for right now and say, do you have any questions or comments? Because, I mean, I can go on for hours and hours and hours. Time has already flown by. Is there any questions or comments for me about anything so far? Stephanie Gonkis has so many questions. Thank you, Stephanie. And Stephanie, if you were here, I'd let you ask all those questions. But since you're not, and you bring oatmeal cream pies with you, we have a competition <laughs> of oatmeal cream pies. <laughs> Stephanie and Greta immediately denounced her ability. Her. She's already said, you got, got this. You got this. Yeah. She's like, so I don't care. Not. You got this. <laughs> So here's what I'm going to do. As we, I'm just solid. So as you're thinking of any kind of question or comments at all, I'll say this quickly. I'm not going to read all this handout for you next time. We're not. You can read some characters. The only thing I'm going to really spend more time on later on will be the bottom page three. But you know, if I encourage you to read this, you know, put them near your toilet or something. Just you know, Greg, I'm saying, <laughs> do a little something, something to give you a little something to pass the time. So you're not going to finish like, going over this? Is that what you just said? I, well, not all but word for word. That'll be boring. You can read yourself, I hope. Uh, but I will go. I'm going to keep the handout because I will go over some of it next time. I'm just saying I'm not going to go over everything. Punishment, crowns, well, I'm not going to do that. But some of this I will go over. And then we'll do that and Revelation starting next week. So we'll do some of this and move into the book. So any questions or comments about anything at all? No, ma'am, there's not a workbook book. If you do want if you do want a commentary, there's a few I recommend, but I always say but I'll start with the one I recommended, The Apocalypse of John by Talbert. Again, there's a great copy that made its way around somewhere. I, I bought it. You bought it already. Boom, she got it. <laughs> there's another one right there in the on the welcome desk. There's one more. Uh, but again, if I were you made if you want it, if you, and it's up to you, right? If you want it, I'd order it tonight, give it some time to get here. Um, it'll help you because that way when I'm gonna say I'm not doing that. Three chapters, and we'll skip ahead. And you're like, but I want to know. We'll look in the commentary, and you'll, yeah. Yes, sir. Stephanie Gaki asks, I'm wondering if I'm, if if my being cremated and shot off in fireworks makes it difficult to get my body back. Good question. So, if you're cremated and shot off in fireworks, can you get your body back? That is a first class ticket to hell, Stephanie. So, I would never, <laughs> never do that. Next question, Stephanie. <laughs> Now, if you do it in deep dish pizza, oh, yeah, uh, Christians, speaking of, I always get the question about cremation, just not as creatively as that, that's pretty good. Um, the Christian worldview does not hold any view at all about cremation. Uh, the New Testament says nothing about it, so there's there's no reason why, I would argue, my view is, there's no reason at all why a Christian can't be cremated, none. In fact, I would suggest that if it's my own family, like it's cheaper, I think, right? So I would yeah. Who cares? I don't know. Oh, look how fancy he looks. And this $12,000. Man, use that money for the poor. Are you kidding me? I want a $20,000 casket. That's going to rot. I don't yeah. want more land space that's then than I have now. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to buy a small car for my corpse. That's me. I'm, I mean, I'll be, that's, you know, whatever. Poor Hayden. Poor Hayden. Bless his heart. Uh, I mean, I like a ceremony, but I don't need this fancy, fancy. I don't, I don't need that. I'll see you face to face later with a brand new body. That I will look just like John Swanson. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> and so will everyone else. Woo, so it's not gonna 
wait for that glory to come. What are you going to arm wrestle? John and Jesus. Over the top, son. Over the top. Uh, any other questions or comments about anything? Yes, ma'am. If it's related to Revelation, if not, I can wait till after the class. Some people who are dead, uh, I hear that uh, they put the, 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 their dogs or cats in the, inside the coffin. Yeah. Is that, are they going to be uh, united with Jesus to the dogs and the cats? Good the question. So do animals, dogs, and cats, will they be united with Jesus? Uh, absolutely not cats. Dogs, yes. Horses, uh, too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Horses, and eh. eh. Now, the Bible says nothing about that. Uh, oh, yeah. Nothing about it. Some Christian thinkers say absolutely not. They're going to say because they don't have a soul. Uh, I'm not as persuaded as they are that that's true because that's. I don't think you should make the deduction based on that alone. Is it possible? Absolutely. C.S. Lewis had an interesting idea. That's an idea my favorite author, um, he said he thinks, yes, he thinks that it's possible that basically the fact that we make dogs or animals, we domesticate them and we make them lovable. And somehow in that process, it's part of that kind of saving creative process. He doesn't know either. He's like, I wonder. Yeah. But I think I, I think we'll have animals in the world to come. I think we'll have animals. A disembodied, like I've got two dogs. When they die with their dog soul, I, have, I don't know about all that. I, don't yeah. I care, but I don't care. But the Bible says nothing about that. Yeah. There's one portion of the Psalms that talk about animals, something. They'll say, see, dogs go to, or animals go to heaven. I don't find that interpretation persuasive. Good. Anything else? Okay. I'm not taking on milk cream pies, though, so. Okay. I will. <laughs> Let me say a prayer for us. Can I do that? We thank you, God, so very, very much for tonight. The ability to think about your text. God, help us not give up ever when we're trying to understand Scripture. Please help us. God, it's easy sometimes for us to throw our hands up, especially with genres that don't make much sense to us or are not as easily accessible to us. God, please help us be disciplined, not give up, and know that all those efforts are fruitful in you and via your spirit. God, also, I ask for your encouragement to help us all uh, not ever kind of worship or seek out certainty so much we tend to do and because we just were not like you we're not omniscient and so God as much as you revealed to us what things mean we will accept it we look forward to that but God also has Holy Spirit that you of course help us with that interpretation whatever it might be of any text constantly have humility so that we are Christian sisters and brothers first and that together as a family of faith we can love on each other regardless if we come to different conclusions about a text. I mean, my goodness. Help us do that. Holy Spirit, I ask for your encouragement tonight, tonight, God, that you would help us live like you when we leave these doors. This would not be some simple, uh, simple empty classroom time that we would take with us, the God who's sovereign, who rules over the cosmos and reveals himself to us. And God, I know for a fact there are people in this room who are struggling with different things and stresses and worries or whatever. God, please help us give all that to you. Knowing that the tomb is still empty, you are alive and well, and that what we're doing on earth is not in vain. We will see you face to face. And God, when we think about that great homecoming, with all of our loved ones, that, that, God, that is a joyful, hope-filled thought. And God, we give you praise for that. That that hope is real. And that while we might grieve, we don't grieve like people who don't have that hope. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are and what we expect to happen uh, in the world to come. In the praise of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you, Stephanie.